Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look again at our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. We're going to be briefly talking about some theories of the business cycle, just to kind of introduce, hey, why does the business cycle happen? Why do we have these ups and these downs as we move through? And then we're going to wrap up by taking a look at some examples and then some applications. So taking a look at some real world events that have happened over the last uh over the last decade or so and modeling where they fit into this and the impacts of them. So let's go jump over and let's take a look at our aggregate demand, aggregate supply and talk about our business cycle. So, okay, our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, let's, uh, let's draw this out to start off. So we have our vertical, we have our horizontal axes, on the vertical, of course, this is our price level. Again, you can think of this as like your CPI, consumer price index, or the GDP deflator. On the horizontal axis, we have real GDP. Now we have downward sloping. Of course, we have our aggregate demand. And then upward sloping being our aggregate supply curve. And again, right, we talked about in the actual video introducing aggregate supply, we would expect the aggregate supply curve to have these three kind of parts to it. It would be almost that half of a cup or half of a U, initially flat, intermediate, and then steep. But for our purposes, we're going to draw it as just a linear line. And again, we can kind of wave our hands and just assume we're zooming in on that relevant part around our aggregate demand curve. Now, where our aggregate demand equals our aggregate supply, this gives us our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. The short-run macroeconomic equilibrium, now this gives us our value of GDP, and this is real GDP, so I'm just going to go Y prime, because we've already said, hey, this is real GDP. Y prime, denoting that this is our macroeconomic equilibrium. And then corresponding to this as well, we get some price level. Well, suppose we're going to consider this our base here, so we'll set our price level to be 100. So, as we have it, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, this yields our short-run macroeconomic equilibrium. We're also interested in the long-run. Long-run is where we ultimately end up in this case. And the long-run, we're going to presume we start in this long-run macroeconomic equilibrium. And that occurs where our long-run aggregate supply equals our short run aggregate supply equals our short run aggregate demand and when we have intersection of all three of these curves we have a long run stable right equilibrium means that it's stable so we have our long run macroeconomic equilibrium the point where we have this long run aggregate supply curve this point here it isn't dependent on price level that's why it's just a vertical line at this long run aggregate supply curve, we have our potential GDP, that is what we denote as Y star. So that is, here we are in our long run macroeconomic equilibrium. So our actual GDP, as we calculate it, as we figure it out, determined where the short run aggregate demand equals aggregate supply, our actual GDP is equal to our potential GDP, meaning that, hey, we are in our long run equilibrium. Attached to this is the idea of what potential GDP is. The idea behind potential GDP again was that, hey, this is our amount of output if we had full employment. That is, if the only people unemployed were those who were naturally unemployed. That is, unemployed due to structural or frictional reasons. So we could say that, hey, at this point as well, when Y prime equals Y star, we would also get a situation such that our Unemployment rate would be equal to the natural rate of unemployment. So we'd say, hey, the unemployment rate equals U star, the natural rate of unemployment. Okay, from here, we're stable. There's no market forces acting on this model to push us one way or another. We're stable. We're happy. We're just going to be here. And really, this is going to be one of our theories of the business cycle is that we have a stable economy. We are just going to stay right here at this long run equilibrium until a shock pushes us out. And that is our economy, generally speaking, is going to be stable, is going to be happy, it's just going to stay with this long run aggregate supply. It'll change year over year. And the reason it'll change year over year is that maybe our productive capabilities are increasing. 
So our long run aggregate supply is increasing, but from one time period, right in any one kind of year, one period there, well, we're going to be stable. We're just going to stay at actual GDP equals potential GDP outside of a shock. And that is all of a sudden, if we have a shock hitting our system, and that could be either a supply shock or a demand shock, we'll take a look at a few of those later. Outside of that happening, we're just going to stay there. If a shock hits our system, well, then we'll be momentarily thrown into, say, an inflationary output gap. And then we'll become, we'll engage in our natural adjustment process back to our long run equilibrium. If we get a negative shock such that we get thrown into a recessionary output gap, well, then again, we the economy through natural market forces would be engage its natural adjustment process back to the long run. Keeping in mind, we have our adjustment asymmetry. Inflationary output gaps, we typically expect those to resolve, to close themselves relatively quickly. Our recessionary output gaps, well, due to sticky wages, ah, those, guys, those guys tended to take a little bit longer. So that's kind of our first theory about why we have our business cycle, why our economy kind of goes through these booms and busts as we move through time. It's just, hey, we have shocks. The shocks hit us, they push us into a boom. A shock hits us, it pushes us into a bust. That's that's the end of the theory. Um, we also have, right, we talked there about hey, natural adjustment. We have also talked about fiscal policy. And that is, hey, if we have a recessionary output gap or, or an inflationary output gap, if for some reason the government does not want to allow this natural adjustment process to happen fully, the government can always get involved using fiscal policy that is influencing their government expenditure or their rate of taxation in order to influence our aggregate demand curve back towards its long run equilibrium. <clears throat> of course, this isn't a costless procedure. We talked about the issues with fiscal policy. We have decision, we have execution legs, which potentially lead to the possibility of us overshooting our target. That is, we accidentally push ourselves from a recessionary to an inflationary output gap. We also have crowding out effects. That is, as the government starts to spend money, it ends up crowding out private expenditure, which in itself is its own problem. So fiscal policy can help alleviate the struggles, the burdens of recessionary output gaps for sure but it is not without its cost, right? It has, it has a trade-off to be considered there. Now, for the sake of gross generalization, and this is gross generalization, many, many can call me out that there's actually a lot more intricacies to that, and that is true, but hey, this is an introductory course. We're doing a survey of a lot of information here. So if we wanted to kind of roughly break up these shocks into some school of thoughts, well, primarily we have the Keynesian school of thought, which kind of sees that, hey, most of these shocks are through our aggregate demand. That is, most expansions, most recessions are due to changes in demand. That is, changes in our aggregate expenditure. Either we've increased it too much, pushing us into an inflationary, or something's happened causing us to scale back our expenditure, pushing us into a recessionary. The other view on that is, no, 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 these aren't actually demand determined, but rather our neoclassical view which puts a lot more weight onto the productive capabilities of the economy and says, no, well, no, actually most shocks are due to supply shocks, due to changes in input prices, factor prices, um, other exogenous shocks to our economy, such as natural disasters, new technologies that we don't quite understand how to use yet, et cetera, et cetera. And in that case there, that view would be saying that, hey, the business cycle is primarily fueled through the aggregate supply and through our aggregate supply shocks. So, problem is, right, we can't really say, hey, yeah, one's right, one's wrong. Um, of course, there's a lot more intricacies into this debate than just what I've framed here. But, right, in most of economics, there's no clear answer. There's no, hey, it's always a Keynesian shock. Hey, it's always a neoclassical situation. Uh, very few economists would fall strictly into one or the other, right? Recognizing that, hey, there are definitely times where both hold true. Um, the tendency tends to be that people believe more strongly that one explains it better most of the time. That, that tends to be the direction. Another view here is, well, okay, and the one that we looked at right here, typically the problem that you see is recessions, right? Is that, hey, recessions are bad, 
recessions are bad and whether you're Keynesian or neoclassical, it's, hey, recessions are bad. We need to overcome these. We need to get ourselves back to this long run equilibrium. Inflationary output gaps, uh, things are super heated, but hey, everybody has jobs. Everybody's making money. There might be some allocative inefficiencies happening because you're just scrambling for resources, but hey, it's, it's not that bad. It's not the end of the world. Well, okay. Another view kind of has the opposite case. And many would kind of say that this is the Austrian view. Many would argue that it's not exactly, but this has kind of been brought forward by Hayek, a contemporary of Keynes, writing at about the same time. Now, again, paraphrasing, doing a very simple explanation of the theory, hardly doing it justice. Hayek says, no, 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 it's actually the opposite case. It is recessions. Recessions are not the problem. It's the boom. It's these expansionary or these inflationary output gaps that we need to be worried about. That is, during these expansions, we misallocate resources. Or rather, resources don't trickle through the economy perfectly. What ends up happening if we kind of think of the economy as a big cup? Well, if the economy is growing, right, if the economy is growing, ideally, we would like to think of it as just adding water to a cup. And that is, hey, it just adds and it just fills up perfectly all the way along. And it's, hey, nice and level, just like you're filling a cup with water. Well, Hayek argues that maybe that's not the case. Maybe that the economy doesn't just spread out the resources as they trickle in across all sectors, but rather, hey, during the boom, there's one sector that looks really profitable. As that sector looks really profitable, people start to pour their resources into that. And what we end up getting is we get something that looks like this as we fill the cup. And then as we keep filling the cup, it just keeps getting like that. That is, it's not actually equally filling across the entire economy. It is bubbling. It is kind of filling up. It's spiking in this industry that is looks really profitable. Now, this becomes a problem because, hey, when it looking profitable, it makes itself profitable and it encourages more, right? It attracts more and more and more investment, more savings into it, which then just, again, fuels it, fuels it, fuels it, creating a bubble. Eventually, we realize, hey, maybe we were wrong about this or maybe we got a bit too excited about this. Maybe we were wrong and we begin to back out. As we begin to back out, as we begin to rush out of this because we're like, I don't want to be the last one holding the stick. Well, this then causes everything to collapse and this then pushes us into recessionary output gaps. That is, this causes the opposite problem. So Hayek's big theory here is that it's actually the booms that cause the busts. It's this the way that it doesn't actually filter equally through the economy that we have these bubbles that form that ends up creating the busts that follow afterwards. Built upon this is a big argument that government intervention actually just fuels this problem. Government intervention, and I'm going to be extreme here, and I'm just going to say bad. Right? And that is that government intervention is fueling this problem. That is through fiscal policy where the government decides to put money, is creating these little artificial bubbles, as it were, in filling up our economy on whole. And so, hey, that attracts more investment, makes it boom even more, and just sets us up for the next failure. Uh, or as we take a look at monetary policy, and that's, again, coming up in future videos, we get the similar thing through the adjustment of interest rates and money supply and the like. So Hayek kind of argues that, hey, this intervention just creates wrong incentive mismatches, pushing us to fuel industries beyond where they should be, causing this unequal rise of the economy, which then leads to the crash. Hayek's argument then is that, well, we need just a lot more of a whole laissez-faire approach, just hands-off approach, let it be. Um, yeah, recessions suck, they're not good, um, but he argues that by getting involved, we're actually just setting ourselves up for a more long-term collapse. So bit of a dichotomy going on there. Um, of course, there are many other theories to this business cycles, many going on to asset prices and the flow of money and the like. Uh, if you are interested in looking at that farther, I'd recommend that, hey, you take a look at other courses we offer, such as Econ 210 Money and Banking. Uh, that's another great one that takes a look at asset prices and the role of credit and financial markets 
in impacting our actual physical economy. But here we have just that quick overview of some big keys, um, key kind of views of the business cycle. This guy, I should say, it seems like, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. It intuitively holds. A lot of people really gravitate to this uh, theory of our business cycle. This, this view doesn't have as much empirical evidence. Uh, it doesn't seem to hold empirically as well as kind of the Keynesian or the neoclassical view that, hey, they're just random exogenous shocks. So, right, there is a bit of evidence that people have come up, but not, not in such respected papers or not uh, as popular in the end. The mainstream view really does appear to be so far, again, in explaining it in our intro to macroeconomics kind of sense, that it is just these random exogenous shocks that derive, that explain our business cycle. Okay. That being said, let's go jump over and let's take a look at the Canadian economy and let's play around with this a little bit and take a look at a few events that have happened over the last many, last few years and work out what exactly that means for us. Okay, let's start off by taking a look at BC. So BC's economy is approximately, I'm going to be rounding here, just use nice numbers, is approximately $250 billion. That, that's our value of our GDP. So let's start off by saying that we're going to presume that we are in equilibrium at Y prime equals Y star. Now, if we make some farther assumptions, right, as we work through this, is let's presume that BC's marginal propensity to consume is at about 0.75. We'll say farther that our tax rate is at about 30%. That is, right, typically we lose about a third of our income altogether towards taxation. And we'll say finally that our marginal propensity to import is 0.225. A little bit lower than what we'd actually expect it to be, but, but about there. And the reason why I want to go through all this is to work out what my marginal propensity to spend is here in BC. And that works out to be 0.75, 1 minus our tax rate. Okay, we know our tax rate. So 1 minus 0.3 minus 0.225. And okay, why, why am I doing all this? Well, that gives me a marginal propensity to spend of... 0 0.30 and then very similarly I can figure out what our multiplier is and again these are just rough estimates we can figure out our multiplier as 1 over 1 minus our marginal propensity to spend so 1 over 0.7 gives me a multiplier of approximately 1 point uh, let's go to three decimal places 429 Okay, so just a little bit of information about the BC economy on whole. What, what exactly do we want to do with this? Well, a few years ago, Petronas, big Malaysian um, natural gas firm, made the largest ever private investment in the Canadian economy, and in specific, they made this in BC. That is, they announced that they were going to be investing $50 billion dollars in Canada, in BC, in northern BC, to develop natural gas pipelines and shipping facilities, processing, etc., etc., etc. Now, just from looking at this, that's that's massive, right? BC's GDP is about 250. It's actually a little bit less than that. I'm just rounding to make it a nice number. So GDP was about 250, and we're just increasing investment by 50 billion. So Right, that, that's, that's massive. That's like a 20% increase right there. But keep in mind, this is a private investment. This is investment, and this is a change in investment. This is also a new investment that's coming into our province. So, hey, how exactly does this work out? What is this going to do to impact our economy? And then what are going to be the long-run effects of this? Well, okay, we have to keep in mind that in reality, hey, this $50 billion is not just boom hitting our economy all at once. It's going to trickle in, meaning that this isn't going to boom happen overnight and then all the way back as if it all hit at once. But we're likely to wind up at the same finishing solution just over a longer time period, right? It's using an intro model. We have to make a lot of simplifications. So 
okay, we have this change in investment of $50 billion. What does this all work out to be? Well, what we can do is we can actually invoke, right? Like, well, why did we need all this? This looks all like Keynesian cross stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, it was all Keynesian cross stuff because keep in mind what we can work out is that the change in actual GDP is equal to our multiplier times our change in autonomous. And hey, investment's part of autonomous. So a change in investment of 50 billion, all else constant, is a change in autonomous of 50 billion. So we can work that out and we can say that, hey, Y prime equals 1.429, sorry, change in Y prime equals our multiplier times our change in autonomous of 50. So 1.429 times 50 gives us a change in actual GDP of 71.45, and again, that's billion dollars. So that's, that's quite a massive jump, right? We're going from 250 billion all the way out to 71.45 billion. We're going all the way out to 300. Y prime one is $321.45 billion. That's, that's a massive jump in that. But okay, how do we model this? How exactly is this happening? Well, keep in mind, everything we've just done here Right, all of, all of this that we've done just to kind of analyze to put some numbers to it. This has all been through our Keynesian cross. And that is all underneath the assumption that our price level is fixed. So what has just happened? We have this initial guy right here of 250 billion. Right, 250 billion, our initial GDP. We had an increase of investment of 50 billion being multiplied. We are all of a sudden finding ourselves somewhere out like this at this new 321.45 billion. What's, what's going on with this point here? Well, that point there, that is our new aggregate demand given that we've had the shock. So let's move that in line. There we go. So that's our new aggregate demand. I'll call that aggregate demand one. And keeping in mind, as soon as we have a shift, it's like the old aggregate demand ceases to exist, right? So let's just kind of, I don't want to completely get rid of it because we want to keep in mind kind of where it was, but there we go, kind of scribbled it out so we can kind of keep in mind, hey, this no longer exists. Okay, so we notice now that, hey, we have aggregate expenditure up at 321, but our actual output is only at 250. We have all this excess demand. Well, the result of this, as we know, is now this upward pressure on prices in order to satisfy this extra demand for goods and services. Firms need to begin to charge more and able to, in order to be able to produce more. So prices begin to rise. As prices rise, our real consumption, real investment, etc., begin to fall. But that's happening and our output is increasing. So we go through that and we obtain our new short run new short run macroeconomic equilibrium and we see that okay the initial impact of this is an increase in gdp right we're now plus 250 billion that is we're higher than 250 billion but keep in mind we fall short of this 321 billion right and the reason we fall short of that is our actual new value of gdp is because these prices have risen and rising prices has driven down our real output. So, right, we don't get to witness that full expansion in real GDP due to the rising prices. And let's, let's give this a number. Let's say this is something like 102, just to make just to make up a value, right? And this is entirely arbitrary how I'm doing that. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we found that given this, we are now in an inflationary output gap. That is our actual output is greater than our potential output, which means that our unemployment is lower than our natural rate of unemployment, right? Our economy is superheated. We're producing more stuff than we could at full employment. That means we're really scraping to get good workers out of frictional and structural unemployment. We're driving our unemployment rates down. Workers are in short supply, right? We cannot get enough workers right now. If we cannot get enough workers, well, that means we need to drive up our wages. 
driving up our wages in order to attract good talent. As our wages begin to rise, well, this is a rise in factor prices. A rise in factor prices, that's one of our determinants of our aggregate supply curve. That's an increased cost of production. So as a result of that, the amount of stuff we can produce at this fixed price level begins to fall. That is, our aggregate supply curve begins to shift to the left. As our aggregate supply curve begins to shift to the left, it moves its way along our aggregate demand curve here, and it continues, continues, continues until we wind up. And again, I missed my mark. I'm not getting very good at this. There we go. Continues until we wind up back at our long run equilibrium such that our new aggregate demand equals our new aggregate supply equals our original long run aggregate supply. We are once and again back at our potential GDP of 250 billion, real GDP of 250 billion, but with a with a significantly higher, maybe not significantly higher, but with a higher price level altogether. So we would expect this to happen as we move through the whole process of this investment flooding into BC. A spike in investment causing a spike in aggregate demand. The result of this spike in aggregate demand is going to be a crunch on our labor, on our labor force, right? We don't have enough workers in order to meet all the demand for workers. As a result, wages begin to get pushed up across the board. As these wages start to get pushed up, prices start to rise, aggregate supply starts to fall, and we make our way back towards our equilibrium. Okay, so brief little example. We threw some numbers in there to be able to see what happens. Let's go take a look at another example. This one's going to be a rather detailed example. I really want to go into a lot of parts about this because it's going to be a lot happening and I want to fully explain it. And that is, let's take a look at the recent turn of events, the impacts of COVID on the Canadian economy and the lockdown and everything of that. So let's move on and talk about that next. So let's carry on here. Let's take a look again at the Canadian economy on whole. And again, the basic starting point, always the best place to start is to assume we're beginning at our long run equilibrium. And why, why start here? Well, because it's the natural place to start, right? We've already said that this is where our economy is going to tend towards. This is our only stable point in the entire diagram. Anywhere else we ever find ourselves will eventually migrate its way back to here. So we'll always assume, we'll always make the initial assumption that we, we begin in our long run equilibrium. That is, we will begin such that our long run aggregate supply equals aggregate supply equals aggregate demand. Furthermore, with that, it means that our actual GDP equals our potential GDP or that our unemployment rate equals our natural rate of unemployment. Okay, let's talk about what happened here in Canada as we hit the early days of COVID-19 and our lockdown. Right. Keep in mind, if you go back and take a look at the early days of this, so this would have been in... Uh, our March, April, May, June, even of 2020, things things are getting pretty hectic, and there was actually a lot of worry amongst many people as to how this would all play out. Uh, keep in mind, right? Un unemployment rates they spiked from you know historically sitting around four five percent up as high as ten percent, kind of for our national uh, national average. Here in Victoria, they went from really low at about 3% up to about 12%. So quite a drastic spike we witnessed locally here. So, okay, spike in unemployment rates. Well, instantly that tells us, hey, what happened as we went through this? Well, we can work out just based off of that. Unemployment spiked, so unemployment was greater than our natural rate. Well, that must mean if unemployment went up, it must have mean that actual GDP went down, right? Because you need people to make stuff. So if there's more unemployment, there's less stuff. So GDP was down. So we must have had a case such that, hey, GDP was less than our potential GDP. But, okay, what, what happened with this? And really in this case here, we had a twofold shock hit us. On the first side, we had our shutdown. We were told that many people 
they couldn't go to work, right? You can't go to work. You can't go to the factory. You can't go make stuff. You can't go to the mills. You can't go create the lumber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're just stuck at home. Maybe you're temporarily laid off. Like, hey, we have this two-week period of complete shutdown. Sorry, you can't come in. You can't make stuff for the factory. Uh, we're going to lay you off for this two weeks. What this all works out to in this sense here is we've just shut down our production. As we've shut down our production, as we are in lockdown, as we are in quarantine, that is our aggregate supply has contracted as we are now not able to produce without these people. We've just said, sorry, factories are closed. So, okay, off the start, we've had this negative aggregate supply shock. So we've had this negative aggregate supply shock pushing us to the left here. So we had that fall there. Now that was on its own and that was there and that was bad enough, right? As we began to adjust, we wound up at a new short run equilibrium, something like at that point there. And let's keep in mind, as soon as we adjust, the old one stops being. So let's kind of get rid of that. Just so that we can kind of keep in mind that, hey, it's shocked. We don't have two curves going on. We just have what used to be and now the new one. At the same time, following this COVID-19 outbreak, the shutdown, a lot of businesses, a lot of people were going, oh my goodness, this is, this is like the first real crazy pandemic we've had in over a century. What does this mean for our future? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for work? What does this mean for everything? And so initially, we had consumer confidence and business confidence. We had initially confidence tanking. That is, we had a drop in our expectations of the future. We were worried, right? Businesses were worried about their future. They're like, I'm not about to start engaging in investment. I'm worried if I'm even going to be around in six months. Consumers were worried. They're like, I, I'm not going to go buy a new car right now. I'm not going to go buy a bunch of new clothes right now. I'm worried if I'm going to have my job at the end of this. I'm worried if I'm even going to get paid for the next two weeks. So expectations were at an all-time low. So what, what does this work out? Well, this, this similarly impacts our aggregate demand curve. So our aggregate demand also began to fall. So there we go. We had a falling aggregate demand. We had this double hit, as it were. And again, that means that this original aggregate demand curve ceased to be. And so what we notice with this is that as we have two curves shifting, you'll notice the way that I did that is I just did one curve and then the other. I shifted one curve. I said, okay, there we go. We'd have our new corresponding equilibrium. And then, okay, we now have our other curve and again, new corresponding equilibrium. Just like we did, right? You can always do two shocks, but just like walking, it's one foot on the ground at a time, one step at a time. Okay, so where do we find ourselves? We've had these two shocks, and this is, again, grossly simplifying the situation as it arose to us. But we had these two shocks bringing us to this. Where do we find ourselves? We find that we have a new value of GDP. So there's our new value of Y prime. So output clearly fell, right? GDP fell from our initial equilibrium down to this new value of Y prime. In fact, Statistics Canada has just recently in the last little bit released kind of updates as to how significant it was. They're, they're kind of saying that, yeah, GDP contracted 5%. That's, that's a massive contraction of GDP, right? That's, that, that's pretty large. At the same time, what do we expect to happen to prices? So we expect less stuff to be produced, less income to be shared amongst everybody in the country less stuff accessible for us to be able to buy. So, okay, we don't get as much stuff to buy. We don't get as much stuff to consume. We have less income. And then on top of it, on top of it, we're expecting prices to rise, right? Because everything was shut down, because we weren't producing things, because we had this negative aggregate supply shock, well, we had an increase in costs of everything as well. Everything was shut down. Nothing could be produced. Now, all of a sudden, there's a shortage of things compared to the demand that was still there for stuff. Now, yeah, okay, demand went down too, but not nearly as much as that complete shutdown of production we witnessed globally 
and domestically especially too, right? We had a huge domestic shutdown. Okay, what begins to happen? Now, and this is where this is where we get into a lot of confusion as we work through this, right? On the one side, we have what actually began to happen, right? We ended our shutdown. A lot of places began to reopen. As places began to reopen, well, productive capability began to increase. Aggregate supply jumped back. That was almost like a positive aggregate supply shock, offsetting some of the negative. But I, I, I want to ignore reality for a second, and that seems really silly. But I want to ignore reality and kind of how firms responded and kind of you know made our way back because that always happens to a degree. What I want to focus on is the natural response to this and the policy response to this and kind of exaggerating what those outcomes would be. And that's the big thing is that these are going to be exaggerated outcomes from this. So let's start off with the natural adjustment. So that is we hit this recessionary output gap due to the pandemic. We now are finding ourselves way down there. We find prices are rising. Let's suppose the government did nothing. The government did absolutely nothing and said, hey, guess what? This is short-lived. We'll get over it. Don't worry. It sucks, but we'll be back before you know it. It'll only be maybe a year or two. That's, that's nothing, right? Yeah, right. Okay, so how would this take place naturally to respond? Well, through our natural adjustment process, we witnessed that we have really high unemployment. And... So in order to understand the impact that this has, why this unemployment begins to push down wages, let's, let's take a look at the labor market, the market for workers. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have the price of work, the price of labor, which is the wage rate, and our quantity of workers. Now, this might be an hour's work. This might be in number employed. This might be in full-time equivalent. doesn't really matter the technicals as to how we measure it. Just quantity of workers. We're going to have our demand for workers, demand for labor being as such. And then we're going to have our supply of labors. Now our assumption in working through this model right now in the short run is that our supply is vertical. That is, there's only so many people able to work. That is our labor force. We're going to presume that our labor force is constant at this point. We can't add more people. We can't lose people. So our supply of workers is constant in this case. In this, we get our equilibrium. At this equilibrium, we have our wage rate and our quantity. We'll go Q prime not for the equilibrium that we begin with. Well, what begins to happen? Well, we had this drop in GDP. GDP fell. We shut down. Our output is going down. I'm not even allowed to open my factories. So why do I need people? Why do I need workers if I can't even use them to make stuff to make me money? So as a result of this, as a result of the shutdown, as a result of the drop in output, our demand for workers has shifted to the left. It has completely dropped. So we would have our new updated demand for labor. And keeping in mind when that happens, that is essentially that the old one has ceased to be. We'll do a rough erase so we can kind of keep in mind that it was there, but ah, we're not really paying attention to it anymore. Now, the outcome of that, often what we end up doing is we just end up jumping from equilibrium to equilibrium. And we say, hey, look at that. Our wage rate, wage one, our wage rate fell. But uh, that's not that's not actually what happens, right? We have our whole process of sticky wages taking place. So with sticky wages, what do we have? Well, we have right here, this is still our quantity supply. Given the shift in our demand, we now have at the initial wage rate our quantity demanded. So, hey, we have this many people wanting to work in the labor force. We have work, uh, the firms only wanting to hire that many. The difference between the two, that difference is our unemployment. And that is our cyclical unemployment, right? So what begins to happen? Well, eventually, eventually, and this takes, this takes a long time. Eventually, these workers, they're saying, man, I need a job. 
I need to feed my family. I need to pay my rent. I need to pay my mortgage, my utilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe social security is running out. Maybe I just really need to work. For many, it's a hit to their pride. For many, unfortunately, it's that hit to their self-worth, but they begin to push down the price that they're willing to accept in order to work. So the workers begin to accept lower and lower wages. As they begin to accept lower and lower wages, well, the employer begins to say, okay, at that lower wage, we'll increase the quantity demanded, how many workers that we'd be willing to hire at this lower wage, right? In this sense here, this process continues until finally, eventually, we make our way to this new equilibrium, this new equilibrium in our labor markets. Okay, as this is happening, and this takes time in our labor markets to adjust due to sticky wages, as this is happening, our falling wages, that is a falling factor price. Falling factor price is it means that hey it's now cheaper to produce that same unit that it used than it used to be. So falling wages, falling factor prices, all of this affects our aggregate supply curve, meaning that all else equal, for a price level of 102, if my cost of production, if my wages are lower, I can increase the amount of stuff that I'm able to produce increase the amount of stuff, increase the amount of stuff, right? So as a result of falling wages, I am increasing my aggregate supply. This continues dropping my aggregate supply to the right. Aggregate supply increases, increases, increases until we get back all the way back to our initial equilibrium. In this case here, if we want to take a look at the roundabout, oh, sorry, look at that, not all the way back to that initial equilibrium. Assuming that our confidence or expectations of the future never rebounded, we're actually going significantly farther. We're going, missed my mark, there we go. We're going all the way over here with my aggregate supply back to a long-run equilibrium such that, again, output equals potential and a new value of price level that is significantly lower in this case. We can say maybe that's something like 90. So through all of this, through the natural adjustment, if our expectations stay low, our uncertainty stays low through this whole period, wages fall, causing prices to fall, causing output to be able to increase, as all that begins to happen, we face lower wages, but our real output eventually returns back to where it once was. Not necessarily an ideal case. Like we said, this, due to our sticky wages, can take a long time to happen. During this whole process, uh, we have a lot of unemployment. We have a lot of people struggling to make ends meet. We have a lot of people struggling to feed themselves and their family. This is, this is not ideal, right? This is not ideal. So the question is, how can we get involved? How can the government get involved in order to help correct this recessionary output gap? Bring us closer to full employment, bring us closer to potential GDP, our long run macroeconomic equilibrium. Let's take a look at that option. Let's just back up our diagram a bit here. Okay, and this is really what the government did do is the government recognized that we were in this massive recessionary output gap and they said, okay, given that we're in this massive recessionary output gap, we are going to help move things along. Ideally, right, as we've talked about with the cost of fiscal policy, ideally they don't want to push it right back because you have the potential of overshooting, but you do want to encourage the aggregate demand curve. You want to start pushing it back in that direction in order to offset the negative things that have happened. So in this case here, what began to happen? Well, our government, they did massive amounts of government expenditure. They increased their government expenditure in many, many programs around the country, financing new construction across the board of things that uh, maybe we were considering, but now we have good reason to finance today. So we see lots of projects getting kicked off. This is just injection of funds, injection of funds to get people working, to say, hey, 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 
we need to kind of push our demand for labor back to the right here. You lost your job in the private sector, but hey, now we need to build this new dam. We need workers for this dam. Do you want to come help build it? Here we go. Here's more jobs. So government stimulus coming in, stimulating the economy in that way. At the same time, the government engaged in the CERB payment. Now, many people, they fall into this whole trap that, hey, CERB payment is government expenditure. The government was spending a bunch of money giving people something like $2,000 for their CERB payment. They also said other things like the Student Relief Fund and many, many other programs that they implemented all around the same time. Massive amounts of money flowing out. This wasn't government expenditure. This was not government expenditure. And again, we need to go back to our definitions of GDP and realize that government expenditure is government expenditure on goods and services. That is them actually buying something. In these CERB payments, in these student relief payments, they didn't buy anything. It wasn't like you had to go sweep streets in order to get the CERB payment. It's not like you had to go do something and provide something to the government in order to receive the payment. This payment was just a payment because it was in, a, in essence a negative tax. That is, we would say that it was a subsidy or a transfer. So in that case there, these CERB payments, all of these other payments that went out to Canadians, these here were considered a decrease in our tax rate. And on top of that, the government did cut taxes. They cut taxes for many businesses. They cut taxes for many individuals and many income brackets to cut our net tax rate overall. And again, the purpose of all this, if we go back to our Keynesian cross, Planned aggregate expenditure equals our marginal propensity to spend times Y plus A. Well, taxes, that's part of our marginal propensity to spend. Government expenditure, that is part of autonomous. Increasing G, well, that increases A. Decreasing our taxes, well, that increases the amount of money that cycles through our economy. Thus, that increases our marginal propensity to spend. It increases our multiplier. So we have, again, an increase there. If we wanted to visualize what that's doing to our Keynesian cross model, we can quickly take a look at that. We have our axes. We have right there our planned aggregate expenditure, our real GDP. We would have our 45 degree line, such that this is our equilibrium condition, Y equals PAE. We would have had our initial, uh, let's use the right tool. We would have had our initial planned aggregate expenditure, maybe something like this. There would have been my level of autonomous and the slope there, that would have been my marginal propensity to spend, giving us our value of GDP. We'll call that Y prime. Then the government engages in fiscal policy. They increase their government expenditure. So that's our change in G, giving us our change in A. I'll do yellow for my new one here. There's my new autonomous. At the same time, we've had a change in our marginal propensity to spend. It's increased. That is, we now have a steeper slope. So, okay, originally, if we had a parallel slope, we'd be something like that. Steeper slope brings us up. So together, this gives us our new planned aggregate expenditure given G1 and T1. Equilibrium where GDP equals aggregate expenditure. Drag that guy down. And we see that by doing so, by increasing our autonomous, by decreasing our tax rate, we get a good boost to GDP. This good boost to GDP, well, this is our Keynesian cross, so this is all happening, all else constant, that is prices constant. So what this is doing is it's taking our aggregate demand for a fixed price level and pushing it out, right? Increasing aggregate demand for a fixed price level. Let's suppose, and this was a massive, a massive stimulus package, right? This is insane how much money the government threw at this problem to try to correct this and even with that even with that we know that we're still only at 
Maybe, 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 maybe something like this, right? Aggregate demand one. So that is, hey, our aggregate demand being pushed back, but that new short run macroeconomic equilibrium as a result, let's just get rid of that old aggregate demand curve, is still only right here. Still keeping us in a recessionary output gap, despite the massive amounts of funds the government has thrown at this problem. So that is, through all of this, we are still finding ourselves in this Y prime one recessionary output gap. But now because of all of this increase in expenditure, because of all of this crowding out of government involvement, what we're now witnessing is even higher prices, is even higher prices. And I don't know. Between this aggregate supply shock, between the crowding out, bit of both, if you've done any kind of, maybe you're working in construction part-time, maybe you have some construction background, if you've taken a look, price of lumber, well, I think if you were even on one of our presentations from our speaker series, it was discussed, hey, the price of household building supplies has skyrocketed, increased over 100%, um, in some cases over two, 300% in the last year. Right, so massive increases in certain prices, partly due to the shutdown, partly due to crowding out, due to government kind of also stepping in and engaging in massive infrastructure projects. You would have noticed much of our agricultural goods, a lot of food has exploded in price over the last year. Same kind of rationale behind this. We had shutdown in productive capabilities, holding back our food supply, thus pushing up the price and then crowding it out farther pushing up the price. So where we are today, we're still finding ourselves in a recessionary output gap. Governments engaged in massive amounts of stimulus, massive amounts of fiscal policy to attempt to push the aggregate demand back. A lot of this has resulted in decreased unemployment, right? This has caused our demand for workers to increase a little bit. But we still find that we are in, that we are experiencing cyclical unemployment. We still have unemployment higher than the natural rate. We still have GDP lower than potential GDP. And that is we're still in this recessionary period. That is what we're still expecting to witness. Again, holding out that there's no more government stimulus. There's nothing else coming that way. What we're still expecting to witness in this is eventually this downward pressure on wages eventually this return of the aggregate supply curve to the right and hopefully with that that means a bit of a dropping in prices but that's that's still yet to be seen okay so that's kind of a brief again very simplified case of what's been happening with COVID-19 and the responses to it and again we've had to make this a simplified case to work at it with our model with the information we have and available to us if you have any questions in either of the examples we worked through, if you have any questions about our, again, simplified versions of our business cycle, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can either post in the comments below, post to our D12 Frequently Asked Questions site, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.